Um, and like I said uh, earlier, kind of a sweet and sour vacation for us. We were thrilled to get away, all the kids came, but we don't know if this is going to be the last vacation with us all together. And it's going to be gone for six years. So, um, yeah, sweet and sour. Never really experienced anything like that. First one out of the nest, so it's kind of a strange feeling for me. You would think with five of them that I'd get rid of some of them because uh, they stay home. And as my one friend reminded me, because he's got two kids and they've been out of the house since they were 17, he says, Dave, you're blessed. I said, I know, I know. Um, so much has happened this morning, and I'm shocked. Uh, from the songs we sang to the things you shared, uh, on myself was in Nehemiah this morning, and uh, so. I'll be shocked at that, and um, I'll be talking about hats. Uh, you mentioned a flood. I immediately thought about uh, years ago when I was doing a dish on my house, and we had no idea the radiator on the third floor broke. I think I've shared this before, and poured down water. Every room was soaked. Well, I should say every room was soaked. Every room was demolished from the addition. And so the two rooms that we had was the one basement where all the boys were sleeping at that time we didn't have Macy and the bedroom that Margaret and I slept in and when you know the water came through the floor onto the bed down to the basement and flooded where the boys stayed. That was our Thanksgiving that year. I remember driving to work because I had some home early and I decided to work on the house and I'm thinking all right God Thanksgiving consider it all joy that's what you say um, I, I don't know how I can do that right now. Um, I wear a lot of different hats. Presently, uh, here are some that I put on. First and foremost, I am a person that follows Jesus Christ, and I definitely echo the words with Paul, for Paul when he said that in 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. Um, I don't think so. I think I think I. I'm right there with them. I'm a person with problems, and I am a sinner saved by grace. Secondly, I'm a father of five, and I'm a husband. Uh, if I wasn't a father of me, it wouldn't bother me. But I used to have a basic training. I'm a preacher and a pastor. Uh, presently, I also wear the hat of a driving instructor. In the past, I've been a PE teacher, a basketball and soccer coach, construction worker, a house painter, had a cleaning business, was an insurance man for a while. Obviously, I forgot all the different hats that I wore back then, um, side jobs. Um, but even when I was doing them, uh, I always looked at being a pastor as what God has called me to do. And these roles have have to work together, but there are at times tremendous tension in them working together. And while I'm called to have compassion as a pastor, I'm also constrained to communicate what the Bible teaches, the truth. When it comes to certain passages that are very counterculture, cultural, very controversial, uh, I am committed to declare to you what the Bible teaches. And my aim is to do that truthfully, uh, with as much grace as I can, knowing that I'm a person that has problems myself. Jesus is not always politically correct, but he is always perfectly correct. And we have to, we must settle whether we will follow what scripture says or what society says. We need to decide for ourselves who sits on the throne of our heart, our world. For me, uh, it's Jesus. I would guess that for most of you that's the case as well. And as a result, we cannot compromise and cave into culture and what society tells us. We're called to be like Jesus, full of grace and truth. Now, 
as a preacher, when I'm preaching through a book of the Bible, I am forced to tackle topics that I might not choose on. So a guy named Brian Bell helped me today. Uh, but it is a fact that each one of us, as we individually read through the Bible, we are going to come upon certain passages that make us uncomfortable. The temptation is to skim over them because we just don't want to deal with them. But we can't. We can't skip over the verses that make us uncomfortable. We need to read through them. In Mark chapter 9, which we talked about when I was here before, uh, we talked about not causing one of your fellow believers to stumble. We talked about cutting off anything that causes us to sin. I'm glad that's symbolic, otherwise I'd be missing all kinds of fingers and toes and hands. And, and we're called to live out the cause of Christ. And today we come to chapter 10. And Jesus dives into a tough topic, the topic of marriage and divorce. And this brings up all sorts of feelings. And as I was thinking about some of you directly, when I prepared this, I knew it would. But this is what the word says. Some of us might be single, and maybe even feeling a bit lonely, wish we were married. I used to feel that way when I was 32, before I met Margaret. And then some of us, we got married and wished we were single. <laughs> some of us, we've lost our spouse. And so this can be a tough topic. Some of us have experienced the tremendous pain of divorce. And you might have sorrow, loss, regret, relief, anger, guilt, shame, fear, depression, confusion, disappointment, bitterness are all mixed together. One pastor, he wrote, there are a few things more painful than divorce. It cuts to the depths of a person with unlike any other relational cash. The U.S. Census Bureau reports that married couple households have slipped from nearly 80% in the 1950s to well less than 50% today. In the article, Bowling and Living Alone, the Wall Street Journal reported that the nuclear family of two parents and their children is no longer the most common living arrangement. In its place are single adult households. According to census figures, the largest chunk of American households now consists of people who live alone. And I, I tell you, I experience that every day when I drive with these young 16, 17, and 18 year old kids. It is a rarity that they have a mother and father that are both married and one of them is not divorced. And I am shocked that that is, that, that a normal mom and dad that married and stayed married, that that is a rarity today. And we can't really go by these censuses because a lot of people, a lot, especially the young ones, they're not getting married. They're living again. So that throws it all off. Now in the past, I think the church has changed a lot especially over these last 50 years. But in the past, the church has treated divorce like an unforgivable sin. Sin is sin. Period. And it doesn't matter what the sin is. It's still sin. Many people have no choice and have had no choice in a divorce. And it came upon them. It couldn't be ignored. But it always takes two. And if one is unwilling, two becoming one can't really happen. Some people are divorced and remarried, and if that's the case, I believe that God wants to make wherever you are uh, reflect his compassion and his faithfulness and his love and his grace. God always speaks the truth, but he always extends grace. 
And that is because of Jesus on the cross. We sang about that this morning. Again, another tap on the back that they, this, is, this is what we're supposed to be speaking about this Mark, in his gospel, let's understand that he is um, he's the shortest gospel of all of them. And he only includes certain miracles, parables, and teachings in order to always highlight that Jesus is the Savior. And because it's the shortest gospel, not everything Jesus said or did is recorded in Mark. One example occurred, occurs at the, the, the close of chapter 9 and, and in the, the beginning of chapter 10. Mark doesn't mention about a five month period that's recorded in John chapter 7 to 11 and also in Luke chapter 9 to 18. Mark, Mark is real quick to take us to the cross. But I want to pick up on this passage in Mark chapter 10, verse 1. It says, And he left there and went to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan. And crowds gathered to him again and again, as was his custom, he taught them. So Jesus is finished uh, in his ministry in Galilee, and he's making this final trip to Jerusalem for the end comes. And as they head south toward Judea and enter it, they cross the Jordan River into a land that's uh, referred to as Perea. And, and this was a traditional route that the Israelites took, the Jewish people took, uh, basically so they didn't have to go into Samaria. It's interesting because earlier on, Jesus took them directly through Samaria, the Samaria, an uncomfortable place for them to be. This time he didn't, he took the uh, common route. And so the crowds, they, they crush him around him, and once again Jesus begins to teach. And as usually happens, there's a bunch of phony Pharisees that show up and they question Jesus to try to trip him up as was their custom. They're not searching for answers, they're just looking for something they can hold against them. And if you look in verse 2 of chapter 10, it says, And the Pharisees came up in order to test him and ask, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And then the word test there, the Hebrew word, it has the idea of, of testing with a maliciousness. Uh, they kept asking the question, in hopes that Jesus would say something that would incriminate him, that they could hold against him. Now, some background at this point is probably helpful to get us to understand it. Divorce was actually very common in that culture at that time. But there was a lot of controversy surrounding it, just like now. But there were two main schools of thought in Israel championed by two different rabbis. The option of divorce was only available for the husband. And you have rabbi, I'm probably not saying the name right, but Rabbi Shammai, and he said that divorce was permitted only in the event of immorality, adultery. And then you have Rabbi Hillel, and he said divorce was allowed for almost any reason. A man could divorce his wife if she was talking to other women, if she put too much salt in his food, burnt his toes, maybe said something unkind about his mom. The school of Hillel was much more popular and the Pharisees definitely favored his view instead of the other rabbis. <laughs> So the Pharisees, uh, in, in, in fact, in Mark uh, 19.3, they said, is it lawful for, to divorce one's wife for any cause? Um, it, they say in that culture, it wasn't strange for Roman men to have as many as 20 wives in their lifetime. Uh, divorce, and it wasn't as prevalent among Jewish people. Um, it was still an issue. But the Pharisees were hoping that Jesus was going to take the side. And if he did, it was going to divide the people and it was going to give religious leaders ammunition to attack. Now, there's one other cultural connection that it's helpful to know. Some of you might remember this whole scene. Jesus is now in a territory controlled by Herod Antipas. 
Herod had committed adultery and divorced his wife and married Herodias, who had divorced her husband, who happened to be Antipas' brother. John the Baptist, he confronted Herod about his adultery and lost his head for it, literally. In Mark 6, 18, it says, uh, For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So maybe the Pharisees are trying to force Jesus to say something that they can report to Herod, and he's going to arrest and take Jesus' head just like he did John's. One pastor put it like this. <clears throat> if Jesus sided with the liberal school, suddenly the Pharisees would become conservatives and say Jesus was going against the law of Moses. If he sided with the conservatives, they would say he was going against public opinion. This was a trap that was set. If he condemned divorce, he's going to suffer the same fate as John, most likely. If he condoned divorce, he's going to lose the confidence of all the devout people. Between a rock and a hard place. The same thing happened when they brought the woman and they caught in the midst of adultery. While Moses is stoning, what did Jesus say? He was with him. Whoever is without sin threw the first stone. They all dropped the stones and walked away. He was then between rock and hard place. Same type of thing. But I love how Jesus turns the tables on him. And he does it several ways. First thing, he answers their question with a question himself. Question of his own. In verse 3, he answered them, what did Moses command you? Moses was their go-to guide. Uh, Moses wrote the law. Moses wrote a big portion of the Old Testament that they followed. But let's keep going. So he answers their question with the question of his own. And that's very, very important that we look at that question. What did Moses command you? Second thing is, he immediately takes them back to the Bible. It ultimately didn't matter what the two rabbis said. And it doesn't really matter and shouldn't matter to us what famous pastors said or what the scholars said. What matters is what the Bible says. That's why I love Paul and Mark to preach to the Marines because he said they went home every night and checked scripture to make sure what Paul said was true. He takes them back to the Bible. The third thing he does is he uses the word command. He uses the word, what did Moses command you? And that was to show that this question could not be settled by society or some rabbis, but whatever happens, or whatever happens to be politically correct at the time, just like the situation that we're in now. And then the fourth thing, he personalizes it by using the word you. The Bible always has to be applied personally. We're told it's living and active. I love how Jesus moves people from the, 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 the theoretical to the practical and personal. The question is not what's your view, it's what about you? What did Moses command you? Verse 4, the Pharisees summarized their interpretation of Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 to 4, which was the law, and it says that Moses allowed, uh, they said, uh, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of divorce, and, uh, divorce and to send her away. It's interesting that in the response, their response to Jesus, they didn't use the word command, they used the word allow. I'm guessing they were looking for a loophole. And Jesus calls them out on their uh, sloppy Bible study methods by pointing out that the passage doesn't condone divorce, but it controls divorce. He said, when a man takes a wife and marries her, it, if 
then she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found something indecent in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house. Because divorce was pretty rampant at that time, Moses gives these regulations to make sure a wife who is divorced by her husband is not left destitute. So in order to protect these women, Moses told them that a wife has to be given a divorce certificate so that she wouldn't be thrown out in the street and, and couldn't remarry. Now, now, did that happen? Yeah, it did happen from time to time. But, but you see, the, 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 the goal of this was, was to make it so it didn't. The permission to remarriage must be seen in the context of the divorce that has already taken place. So if you look at Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 5, and Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, he wrote you this commandment. And the word hardness there, the, the Greek word, it means a stiffening of the heart, uh, an obstinance, a uh, stubbornness, a uh, perverse uh, attitude. And I love what Jesus does next as he turns the conversation from a discussion about divorce to the divine design of marriage. He reframes the question, when is it okay to divorce, to what does God say about marriage? The religious leaders are all up on the current culture and what it says about divorce, and when they consult the Bible, they're looking for something to justify their position, just like people do today. Let me read the Bible and find out what it says that I can agree with. And Jesus takes them and us all the way back to the two chapters in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. In verse 6, uh, he says, But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. By the way, he says this two or three times. And I think right there, that speaks to what's going on in our country today. No, I'm sorry. There's a male and a female. There's two genders. Period. God makes it abundantly clear. It's a foundational truth that God made humans male or female. And Jesus gives us four things to think of regarding marriage in verses 7 to 9. I'm going to go through them. Again, Mr. Bell, help me here. Uh, first is leaving. Leaving. And Jesus quotes from Genesis 2, 24, and he says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother. And once again, we see clearly from God's original design in marriage that is between one man and one woman for life. And we always have to choose scripture over society. And sometimes that's tough, I get it. But we said, we believe, we sang it. The Bible does not allow same-sex marriages. I'm sorry. It doesn't. There's nowhere you can find that. The Hebrew word for leave here, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, is very strong, and it means to cut off, to abandon, to forsake, to leave behind. So when you get married, you need to leave your parents. And what this means is that you need to sever that, 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 that emotional umbilical cord because your loyalty now belongs to your spouse and the new family you're starting. And we're all hit with divorce, whether we've been divorced, whether we have somebody in our family that's been divorced. And I've seen it all too often, in fact, in my extended family, I see it happening right now where your partner should never have to compete with your parents. And leaving your parents doesn't mean you ignore them or you don't spend time with them or that our children don't need us still or don't spend the time with them. But it does mean that the marriage that they created 
that we create when we get married, that becomes the new priority. And the new family has to have a priority over the previous one. It doesn't mean that they don't matter. It doesn't mean you're not still part of the family. But that new unit is important and has to be a priority. So the first thing is leaving. A man must leave his father and mother. Not say goodbye, but step away from that emotional and biblical quarter, so to speak. The second is cleaving. Jesus then says, and hold fast to his wife. Once you leave, then you need to be committed to a permanent relationship with your wife. To hold fast literally means to be glued together, to melt two pieces of metal together, to hold fast, a permanent bond. And it has the idea of joining two things so tightly that they can't be separated without damaging things. A good friend of mine, he had this uh, shelf unit uh, that he was, he was doing. Um, it was made of some kind of wood and it was covered with this beautiful veneer. But the veneer, the veneer had had several places where water just disrupted it and it, it made it so he decided, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to strip off the veneer and then sand it down. It's going to be beautiful. And I agree. And so he began the process of stripping off the veneer. And at one point, when he was taking a piece of stubborn veneer off, it actually ripped out a huge chunk of that shelf unit. Basically, destroyed it. And I think that's what, what we're getting at here. Is that from God's point of view, marriage is this unique joining of two people to become one. And notice again from this, this demand, the divine transaction, God has glued two together to become one. And that is why divorce is so devastating. And those of you that have gone through it, you know it. In our society, it is so easy to get married. It's the living together afterwards. Of course, it's all the problems. <laughs> That's probably why we have a pandemic of people living together without being married. <laughs> Over 35 years of marriage, a wife had given her husband a great food for breakfast every day of their married life. And one day she ran out of great fruits. And she apologized profusely to her husband, and the husband smiled. And he just said, That's okay, dear. I never liked to pray for And then she said, Oh my gosh, me too, but I thought you loved it. <laughs> yes, maybe, maybe they need to talk a little bit more, but, but isn't that the truth? After so many years of marriage, you're still learning about each other. And that brings me to the next point. Weaving. Jesus states that the goal of marriage in verse 8, he says that two will become one flesh, and they are no longer two but one flesh. Once leaving and cleaving take place, you can experience weaving as you become one flesh. And this phrase has the idea of oneness. And this unity is to be experienced emotionally, spiritually, as well as physically. So in God's marital man, one plus one equals one. That's the title of this message. God's objective for marriage is a loving relationship of oneness. To become one's flesh is a lifetime process. Let's not kid ourselves. Ephesians 5, 20, uh, 532 says it's a great mystery. Now, marriage is not a contract. It's a covenant. In a contract, two parties remain separate. They're kind of like oil and water. They might be shaken up and mixed together, but you leave them there long enough to separate back to their, their, their regular self. Left alone, they will eventually separate and come back to what they were in the beginning. In a covenant, two become one and the same. 
I'm like mashed potatoes. What do you do? You take two potatoes, a sweet potato and a regular potato. You skin them, you cut them up, you put them in hot water, all to soften them, and then you mash them together and they become. And let's remember the skinning and the cutting and the hot water is to soften them so they can become one. And that's why marriage can be so tough. It's the weaving part. Ecclesiastes 4 9 to 12. Any of you know this passage? Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they must keep warm. They can keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. And I love the way King James Version puts it in this, in this passage. He says, the threefold cord, not quickly broken. And obviously the third or is Jesus Christ in the center. Leaving, cleaving, and weaving describe what marriages look like. When the marital vow, the covenant, is broken, grieving is short. Grieving. The sanctity of marriage is grounded in God himself. That's the way he wants it to be. And to, to break what he has brought together grieves him as well as us. I think every time it happens, God feels the pain. In Malachi 2.16, in the uh, NASB version, I think you have the King James in your uh, handouts there, it says, For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel, and him who covers his garment with wrong, says the Lord, who so take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. God's objective for marriage is a loving relationship of oneness. Jesus said it in Mark uh, 10, verse 9. He said, What therefore God has joined together, let not, let not man separate. We hear that at weddings all the time, right? The word join means yoke together. And I love this. I love this. Um, marriage is meant to be a yoke, not a joke. Ah, I didn't think it would be this. <laughs> The yoke, when we're talking about a yoke, it, it maximizes the work capacity of two animals that are in it, that are yoked together. Um, two animals yoked together with the heavy wagon, they can do more. Uh, did you know that one Belgian draft horse, I love this, is able to pull about 8,000 pounds? That's pretty amazing. There. However, if two Belgian draft horses are yoked together, they can pull 32,000 pounds. Two together can accomplish four times as much as the work of one. And that's the power of synergy. A good relationship has a good reward for its toil when couples come together. When they work as one. Great things. Awesome. If we're married, we need to be vigilant about guarding our vows, determining to keep them even when feelings fade. And let's be honest, feelings fade. They go down, they go up, sometimes they're really intense, sometimes they're not. That's a reality. And when that happens, sure, it can get tough, but feelings, I've learned, are the caboose. And the vows that I made that is the engine that drives it. Feelings will come and go, but the engine keeps it moving. So we need to make sure that we have done the leaving part, that we're doing the cleaving part, and we're allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work of weaving our two lives into one. And I realize that this message is not for a lot of us because we might be divorced or we might not have a spouse. But this is God's word and I guarantee you there are people in your life that need this truth. 
So if it's not for you personally, take it, hide it, because God's going to give you a chance to share. And after hearing his disciples, they wanted to go a little bit deeper. So in verse 10, it says, And in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. And as Jesus often does, he talks with boldness about what God says in his word. He says, remember, uh, and he says it's strong. Because he has a strong view about marriage, as does God. And in verses 11 and 12, he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Now, the use of uh, adultery here directs the, the disciples back to the command of God in Exodus chapter 20, when it says, You shall not commit adultery. But notice about that answer that Jesus gave them. Notice that Jesus elevates the status of the wife. He gives her equal rights and responsibilities, unlike our rabbis. He says, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. He's given a quality there. That was very counter-cultural. So here are some takeaways as I conclude. First, God hates divorce. Because uh, of the unresolved problems it reveals, because of all pain and wounds it causes. And we can't order this down and try to act like he doesn't. God hates divorce. Secondly, and this is really, really important. God does not hate divorced people. So maybe you're divorced. You've suffered. Maybe you're still suffering. I imagine that pain is lingering. Whatever circumstances, whatever the circumstances of your divorce were, God does not hate them. He does not hold it against you. He has forgiven you. He loves you. He pours down his grace upon you. We sang that this morning. Third thing, divorce is not the only thing God hates. Sometimes we tend to, sing, to single out certain sins. Be worse to be one of them. This is what God says in Proverbs 6 16 to 19. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers and sisters. One who sows discord, a backbiter, somebody who talks behind people's back, somebody who causes dissension. I don't know about you, but I can place myself in some of those. I'm as guilty of those as some other people, and God hates it. Divorce is not the only thing God hates. And fourth, God does not forbid all divorce. There are two exceptions to the no divorce dictated scripture. First Corinthians 7 15 teaches that if the unbelieving spouse wants to break it off, the believer can let him or her go. And I know some of you went through a lot of pain and maybe going through certain amounts of pain because you have a spouse that is an unbeliever. And it rips your heart. And you want so much for them to come to know Christ. So what can we do except that we keep praying and we keep living according to the word and we keep bringing them before him. But sometimes they won't leave. And according to scripture, we step back. Now, it's not saying that's what he wants, but according to scripture, he's saying that that's allowed. 
In Matthew 5.32 and Matthew 19.9, Jesus recognizes that in the case of unrepentant adultery, the one who has been wronged is not obligated to stay married. But having said all of that, with these exceptions, God's heart is always for reconciliation and restoration of that marriage covenant because he knows, just like the veneer on wood, it's going to hurt. God's heart is always for reconciliation and restoration. When you have a spouse that dies, that releases you from the marriage covenant too. And I think it's safe to say if somebody is in an abusive situation or in a dangerous situation, it's wise to maybe separate for a time and seek re reconciliation and restoration. Some people call that the abandonment clause. So God does not forbid all divorce. Five, hold on to hope if your marriage is in a bit of a mess. Jesus loves putting her things back together. So, if we find ourselves there, we don't need and we shouldn't start looking for a way out, but rather a way through. And the truth is, if we and our spouse are not working at oneness together, we drift into isolation. And sometimes it takes years. <laughs> a lot of skinning and cutting and hot wood to mesh us together. The last thing, deal with any unfinished business. Maybe you're the one that needs to ask for forgiveness from God and from the spouse. Or maybe you're the one that needs to extend forgiveness to a, a former spouse and see what kind of reconciliation you can. Or maybe you're the child of divorce. And I know lots of kids that they just hold it against their parents. Their parents got divorced and they have this bitter place in their heart. Maybe, maybe your parents were divorced. Maybe you've held something against them. It's time for you to forgive. It's time for you to deal with that unfinished business. And I recognize that the church in general has not been this oasis of compassion and understanding. In some instances, the church has been just outright harsh and nasty toward divorced people. I think TCC is a tremendous exception to that. I know a lot of you have experienced the pains of divorce, and probably, you know, I hope this didn't stir up a lot of bad feelings. I hope instead it just drives us to the cross. Maybe you're wearing a hat of guilt and shame. Or maybe you're wearing a hat of remorse and regret. And if you are, this is what you need to remember. And this is what you need to be proud of. We have a hat of His grace and His love toward us. And it has a big J on it. And that's the one we need to keep on. God's grace is greater than our guilt and our shame and our remorse and even our anger. His mercy covers. What may happen, what happened in our marriage, even if it was our fault, His grace covers that. And so every week, every week, we celebrate that. Because we celebrate the cross. And it always comes back. It comes back to the cross, doesn't it? As we share communion this morning, Let's think about it. And again, this might not apply to you directly, but it's God's word. It's God's truth. And I believe that it happened to be in Mark 10, and therefore we have to cover it. Sorry that it stirred up bad feelings, but again, that's why we're celebrating communion again. God's grace covers it.